History of East Timor Pre-colonial history The island of Timor was populated as part of the human migrations that have shaped Australasia more generally. As of 2019, the oldest traces of human settlement are 43,000 to 44,000 years old, and were found in the Lely Cave in Manitudo municipality. These early settlers had high-level maritime skills, and by implication the technology needed to make ocean crossings to reach Australia and other islands, as they were catching and consuming large numbers of big deep-sea fish such as tuna. One of the oldest fish hooks in the world, dated between 16,000 and 23,000 years old, was excavated at the Jerry Malai Cave. It is believed that survivors from three waves of migration still live in the country. The first is described by anthropologists as people of the Veto Australoid type. Around 3000 BC, a second migration brought Melanesians. The earlier Veto Australoid peoples withdrew at this time to the mountainous interior. Finally, Proto Malays arrived from South China and North Indochina. Timorese origin myths tell of ancestors that sailed around the eastern end of Timor arriving on land in the south. These multiple waves of migrations combined with the mountainous geography of the island led to a diverse mix of languages and culture. What is now East Timor was split between up to 46 kingdoms. However, there was little influence from the large Islamic Javanese powers to the west. The later Timorese were not seafarers, rather they were land-focused people who rarely made contact with other islands. Timor was part of a region of small islands with small populations of similarly land-focused people that now make up eastern Indonesia. Contact with the outside world was via networks of foreign seafaring traders from as far as China and India that served the archipelago. Outside products brought to the region included metal goods, rice, fine textiles, and coins exchanged for local spices, sandalwood, deer horn, beeswax, and slaves. Several fortifications uncovered in Timor were built between 1000 and 1300. Climatic changes, in particular during the Little Ice Age, and the increased trade in sandalwood, are thought to have increased tensions around the control of resources during that time. The first known mention of Timor in writing can be found in the 13th century Chinese Zhu Fanji, which describes various products and civilizations found outside China. In the Zhu Fanji, Timor is called Tiwen and is noted for its sandalwood. In 1365, the Nagarikari Tagama, which contains descriptions of the Majapahit Empire at its peak, identifies Timor as an island within Majapahit's realm. However, as Portuguese chronologist Tomé Pires wrote in the 16th century, all islands east of Java were called Timor. Early European explorers report that the island had a number of small chiefdoms or princedoms in the early 16th century. One of the most significant is the Weehali Kingdom in central Timor, to which the Tetum, Bunak, and Kamak ethnic groups were aligned. The first circumnavigation of the world, the Magellan Expedition, visited Timor, and they recorded that Lakos, people from Luzon, Philippines, traded in East Timor in order to gather sandalwood for export abroad. Portuguese rule. The first Europeans to arrive in the area were the Portuguese, who landed near present-day Pant Macassar. These Portuguese were traders that arrived between 1512 and 1515. However, only in 1556 did a group of Dominican friars establish their missionary work in the area, settling just north in Solar. 42 war with the Netherlands reduced Portuguese control in the Malay archipelago, limiting them mostly to the lesser Sunda Islands. Later wars further reduced Portuguese influence, with Solar falling in 1613, and Kupang in the west of Timor falling in 1653. By the 17th century the village of Lifo, today part of the Akusi enclave, had become the center of Portuguese activities. At this time, the Portuguese began to convert the Timorese to Catholicism. Starting in 1642, a military expedition led by the Portuguese Francisco Fernandes took place. The aim of this expedition was to weaken the power of the Timor kings and even as this expedition was made by the Tapasas, the black Portuguese, it succeeded to extend the Portuguese influence into the interior of the country. In 1702 the territory officially became a Portuguese colony, known as Portuguese Timor, when Lisbon sent its first governor, with Lifo as its capital. Portuguese control over the territory was tenuous particularly in the mountainous interior. Dominican friars, the occasional Dutch raid, and the Timorese themselves provided opposition to the Portuguese. In 1769, seeking to wrest control from the Tapasas, the Portuguese governor moved his administration along with 1,200 people from Lifo to what would become Dili. The control of colonial administrators, largely restricted to Dili, had to rely on traditional tribal chieftains for control and influence. For both Portugal and the Netherlands, 
Timor remained a low priority with little presence outside of the cities of Dili and Kupang. Nonetheless, continuing disputes over competing spheres of influence with the Dutch led to a number of treaties aimed at formalizing borders and eliminating enclaves, 42 The border between Portuguese Timor and the Dutch East Indies was formally decided in 1859 with the Treaty of Lisbon. Portugal received the eastern half, together with the north coast pocket of Akusi. There are competing views over whether this border reflected existing cultural differences. This 1859 treaty saw Portugal take control of Mabra, where the Dutch had begun coffee cultivation, in exchange for formally relinquishing claims in Solar and Flores. In 1840 more, along with Macau and Solar, was removed from the jurisdiction of Portuguese India. A few years later in 1850, Portuguese Timor was removed from the jurisdiction of the governor of Macau, before being returned to the jurisdiction of Portuguese India in 1856. In 1863, Dili was declared a city, although the news may not have arrived to the city until the next year, and East Timor became directly subordinate to the Lisbon government. In 1866 the territory was again put under the jurisdiction of Macau. An 1887 mutiny in Dili led to the death of the governor at the time. The territory was separated from Macau for the last time in 1896, again coming directly under the jurisdiction of Lisbon, and becoming a full province in 1909. In 1910-12, the East Timorese rebelled against Portugal. Troops from Mozambique and naval gunfire were brought in to suppress the rebels. The definitive border was drawn by The Hague in 1914, and it remains the international boundary between the modern states of East Timor and Indonesia. Makatar became part of Portuguese Timor during this period. The Portuguese Timorese Pataka became the sole official currency in 1915. Difficulties in communication and logistics arising as a result of World War I led to trade disruptions. Economic difficulties and an inability to pay salaries led to a small revolt in 1919. For the Portuguese, East Timor remained little more than a neglected trading post until the late 19th century. Investment in infrastructure, health, and education was minimal. The island was seen as a way to exile those who the government in Lisbon saw as problems, these included political prisoners as well as ordinary criminals. Portuguese ruled through a traditional system of liurei, local chiefs. Sandalwood remained the main export crop with coffee exports becoming significant in the mid-19th century. In places where Portuguese rule was asserted, it tended to be brutal and exploitative. At the beginning of the 20th century, a faltering home economy prompted the Portuguese to extract greater wealth from its colonies. Portuguese Timor had been a place of exile for political and social opponents deported from the metropolis since the late 19th century. Among them a large proportion were members of the anarchist and anarcho-syndicalist movement, which until the Second World War was the most influential of the left-wing movements in Portugal. The main waves of deportations to Timor were in 1896, 1927, and 1931. Some of the activists continued their resistance even in exile. After World War II, the remaining exiles were pardoned and allowed to return. Although Portugal was neutral during World War II, in December 1941, Portuguese Timor was occupied by Australian and Dutch forces, which were expecting a Japanese invasion. This Australian military intervention dragged Portuguese Timor into the Pacific War but it also slowed the Japanese expansion. When the Japanese did occupy Timor, in February 1942, a 400-strong Dutch-Australian force and large numbers of Timorese volunteers engaged them in a one-year guerrilla campaign. After the Allied evacuation in February 1943 the East Timorese continued fighting the Japanese, with comparatively little collaboration with the enemy taking place. This assistance cost the civilian population dearly, Japanese forces burned many villages and seized food supplies. The Japanese occupation resulted in the deaths of 40,000 to 70,000 Timorese. Portuguese Timor was handed back to Portugal after the war, but Portugal continued to neglect the colony. Very little investment was made in infrastructure, education, and health care. The colony was declared an overseas province of the Portuguese Republic in 1955. Locally, authority rested with the Portuguese governor and the legislative council, as well as local chiefs or liurei. Only a small minority of Timorese were educated, and even fewer went on to university in Portugal, there were no universities in the territory until 2000. During this time, Indonesia did not express any interest in Portuguese Timor, despite the anti-colonial rhetoric of President Sukarno. This was partly as Indonesia was preoccupied with gaining control of West Irian, now called Papua, which had been retained by the Netherlands after Indonesian independence. In fact, 
At the United Nations, Indonesian diplomats stressed that their country did not seek control over any territory outside the former Netherlands East Indies, explicitly mentioning Portuguese Timor. In 1960 East Timor gained the right to self-determination under international law, as a non-self-governing territory. It retained the status, with Portugal as the administering power, throughout Indonesian rule. The small 1959 Vikaki rebellion saw attempts by the rebels to seek support outside their local area, although it did not overcome local rivalries. Its calls for better services and rights led to some changes in Portuguese policy such as increases in education and civil employment. Basic schooling was increased, and more advanced schools that included secondary education were available to the most Portuguese individuals, those considered mestico or assimilative. A Catholic school in Suabeta, the Seminary of Our Lady of Fatima in Dare, and the Lysu Dr. Francisco Machado were important educational establishments during this time. Fatumaca College was established near Baco in 1969, and an Escola Tecnica was set up in 1973. The politicians who came to prominence at the end of Portuguese rule tended to have studied in these schools, and some cited the Vicaqui Rebellion as an inspiration. This Timorization, which resulted in greater local participation in administration and the military, remained mostly limited to the aforementioned upper class, and did not substantially affect the majority of the population. Decolonization, coup, and independence. The decolonization process instigated by the 1974 Portuguese Revolution saw Portugal effectively abandon the colony of Portuguese Timor. A civil war between supporters of Portuguese Timorese political parties, Fridolin, and the UDT, broke out in 1975 as UDT attempted a coup which Fridolin resisted with the help of local Portuguese military. One of the first acts of the new government in Lisbon was to appoint a new governor for the colony on November 18, 1974, in the form of Mario Lemos Pires, who would ultimately be, as events were to prove, the last governor of Portuguese Timor. One of his first decrees made upon his arrival in Dili was to legalize political parties in preparation for elections to a constituent assembly in 1976. Three main political parties were formed. The Uniao Democrática Timorense, UDT, Timorese Democratic Union, was supported by the traditional elites, initially argued for a continued association with Lisbon, or as they put it in Tietum, made Bandera hum in the shadow of the Portuguese flag, but later adopted a gradualist approach to independence. One of its leaders, Mario Vigas Carascalau, one of the few Timorese to have been educated at university in Portugal, later became Indonesian governor of East Timor during the 1980s and early 1990s, although with the demise of Indonesian rule, he would change to supporting independence. The Associaco Social Democratica Timorense, ASDT, Timorese Social Democratic Association, supported a rapid movement to independence. It later changed its name to Frente Revolutionaria de Timorlst Independent, Revolutionary Front of Independent East Timor or Fridolin. Fridolin was regarded by many in Australia and Indonesia as being Marxist, its name sounding reminiscent of Frelimo in Mozambique. The party committed itself to the universal doctrines of socialism. The Associaco Popular Democratica Timorense, Apodeti, Timorese Popular Democratic Association, supported integration with Indonesia, as an autonomous province, but had little grassroots support. One of its leaders, Abilio Osorio Sors, later served as the last Indonesian-appointed governor of East Timor. Apodeti drew support from a few Liurei in the border region, some of whom had collaborated with the Japanese during the Second World War. It also had some support in the small Muslim minority, although Mari al Qaitari, a Muslim, was a prominent Fridolin leader, and became Prime Minister in 2002. Other smaller parties included Kliber Owen Timur Asawain, Kota, Tidam for Sons of the Mountain Warriors, which sought to create a form of monarchy involving the local Liurei, and the Partido Tribalista, Labour Party, but neither had any significant support. They would, however, collaborate with Indonesia. The Associaco Democratica para Integraco de Timorlst na Australia, Aditla, advocated integration with Australia, but folded after the Australian government emphatically ruled out the idea. This period saw the emergence of a unified national consciousness among the social elites who led the newly established political parties. Parties compete, foreign powers take interest. Developments in Portuguese Timor during 1974 and 1975 were watched closely by Indonesia and Australia. Suharto's new order, which had effectively eliminated Indonesia's Communist Party PKI in 1965, was alarmed by what it saw as the increasingly left-leaning Fridolin, 
and by the prospect of a small independent leftist state in the midst of the archipelago inspiring separatism in parts of the surrounding archipelago. Australia's Labour Prime Minister, Gough Whitlam, had developed a close working relationship with the Indonesian leader, and also followed events with concern. At a meeting in the Javanese town of Wanasobo in 1974, he told Suharto that an independent Portuguese Timor would be an unviable state, and a potential threat to the stability of the region. While recognizing the need for an act of self-determination, he considered integration with Indonesia to be in Portuguese Timor's best interests. In local elections on March 13, 1975, Friedelin and UDT emerged as the largest parties, having previously formed an alliance to campaign for independence. Indonesian military intelligence, known as Bacon, began attempting to cause divisions between the pro-independence parties, and promote the support of Apodetti. This was known as Operasi Komodo or Operation Komodo after the giant Komodo lizard found in the eastern Indonesian island of the same name. Many Indonesian military figures held meetings with UDT leaders, who made it plain that Jakarta would not tolerate a Fridolin-led administration in an independent East Timor. The coalition between Fridolin and UDT later broke up. During the course of 1975, Portugal became increasingly detached from political developments in its colony, becoming embroiled in civil unrest and political crises, and more concerned with decolonization in its African colonies of Angola and Mozambique than with Portuguese Timor. Many local leaders saw independence as unrealistic, and were open to discussions with Jakarta over Portuguese Timor's incorporation into the Indonesian state. The coup. On August 11, 1975, the UDT mounted a coup, in a bid to halt the increasing popularity of Fridolin. Portuguese governor Mario Lemos Pires fled to the offshore island of Aturo, north of the capital, Dili, from where he later attempted to broker an agreement between the two sides. He was urged by Fridolin to return and resume the decolonization process, but he insisted that he was awaiting instructions from the government in Lisbon, now increasingly uninterested. Indonesia sought to portray the conflict as a civil war, which had plunged Portuguese Timor into chaos, but after only a month, aid and relief agencies from Australia and elsewhere visited the territory, and reported that the situation was stable. Nevertheless, many UDT supporters had fled across the border into Indonesian Timor, where they were coerced into supporting integration with Indonesia. In October 1975, in the border town of Balibo, two Australian television crews, the Balibo 5, reporting on the conflict were killed by Indonesian forces, after they witnessed Indonesian incursions into Portuguese Timor. Unilateral Declaration of Independence While Friedelin had sought the return of the Portuguese governor, pointedly flying the Portuguese flag from government offices, the deteriorating situation meant that it had to make an appeal to the world for international support, independently of Portugal. On November 28, 1975, Friedelin made a unilateral declaration of independence of the Democratic Republic of East Timor, Republica Democratica de Timorlst in Portuguese. This was not recognized by either Portugal, Indonesia, or Australia, however, the UDI state received formal diplomatic recognition from six countries that were led by leftist or Marxist, Leninist parties, namely Albania, Cape Verde, Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, Mozambique, and Sao Tome and Principe. Friedelin's Francisco Xavier do Amaral became the first president, while Friedelin leader Nicolau dos Reis Lobato was prime minister. Indonesia's response was to have UDT, Apodetti, Kota and Trabaliasta leaders sign a declaration calling for integration with Indonesia called the Balibo Declaration, although it was drafted by Indonesian intelligence and signed in Bali, Indonesia not Balibo, Portuguese Timor. Zanana Gusmau, now the country's prime minister, described this as the Baliboong Declaration, a pun on the Indonesian word for lie. East Timor Solidarity Movement An international East Timor Solidarity Movement arose in response to the 1975 invasion of East Timor by Indonesia and the occupation that followed. The movement was supported by churches, human rights groups, and peace campaigners, but developed its own organizations and infrastructure in many countries. Many demonstrations and vigils backed legislative actions to cut off military supplies to Indonesia. The movement was most extensive in neighboring Australia, in Portugal, in the Philippines and the former Portuguese colonies in Africa, but had significant force in the United States, Canada, and Europe. José Ramos Horta, later president of East Timor, stated in a 2007 interview that the Solidarity Movement was instrumental. They were like our peaceful foot soldiers, and fought many battles for us. Indonesian Invasion and Annexation the Indonesian invasion of East Timor began on December 7, 1975. 
Indonesian forces launched a massive air and sea invasion, known as Operasi Saraha, or Operation Komodo, almost entirely using us supplied equipment even if Kissinger feared this would be revealed to the public. Moreover, according to declassified documents released by the National Security Archive, NSA, in December 2001, the United States gave its agreement to Indonesia for the invasion. In fact, when the Indonesian President Suharto asked the understanding of taking rapid drastic action in East Timor to U.S. President Gerald Ford, he replied, we will understand and not press you on the issue. We understand the problem and the intentions you have. The Australian government did not react to this invasion. The reason may be the existence of oil found in the waters between Indonesia and Australia. This lack of action resulted in massive protests by Australian citizens remembering the heroic actions of the Timorese during World War II. Reasons given by Indonesia for the invasion included the potential for a communist government, the need to develop the territory, national and regional security risks. Public statements denied that the invasion was aimed at taking the territory, and noted continued support for self-determination. Nominal elections were held under Indonesian coercion, and on December 17 Indonesia declared that an East Timorese provisional government would be formed that included representatives from Apodeti, UDT, Kota and the Labour Party. Attempts by the United Nations Secretary-General's special representative, Vittorio Winspear Dicciardi to visit Friedland held areas from Darwin, Australia, were obstructed by the Indonesian military, which blockaded East Timor. Citation needed on May 31, 1976, the government selected 37 individuals to for a People's Assembly in Dili. This assembly unanimously endorsed integration into Indonesia, cementing an Indonesian narrative of union with Indonesia as an act of self-determination. 6, 47-48 On July 17, East Timor officially became the 27th province of the Republic of Indonesia, Timor Timur. Citation needed the provisional government made appeals to the UN to have this integration recognized as a legitimate act of self-determination. Nonetheless, the occupation of East Timor remained a public issue in many nations, Portugal in particular, and the UN never recognized either the regime installed by the Indonesians or the subsequent annexation. We can refer to the resolution approved by the United Nations General Assembly on December 12, 1975, saying having heard the statements of the representatives of Portugal, as the administering power, concerning developments in Portuguese Timor, deplores the military intervention of the armed forces of Indonesia in Portuguese Timor and calls upon the government of Indonesia to withdraw without delay its armed forces from the territory, and recommends that the Security Council take urgent action to protect the territorial integrity of Portuguese Timor and the inalienable right of its people to self-determination. Citation needed from 1975 to 1982, the General Assembly asserted each year the right of East Timor to self-determination. Portugal remained the recognized administering authority, and Indonesian forces were called to withdraw. José Ramos Horta represented Friedland at the UN, where he campaigned for independence. Despite this international opposition, few actions were taken to support independence. Many states tacitly accepted Indonesian control. Australia went as far as to officially recognize the annexation, and downplay the death of five Australian journalists during the invasion. Such actions were caused by attempts to remain on good terms with Indonesia, especially in the context of the Cold War. Despite an expressed aversion to the use of military force, the Indonesian invasion was not seriously opposed. Indeed, there was too implicit support. The United States held joint military drills with Indonesia prior to the invasion, and at the time of the invasion around 90% of Indonesia's arms originated from the United States. Military support continued, and even increased, after the invasion. There was also little support among other countries in ASEAN for East Timorese independence, with a similar fear of communism, as well as fear of regional instability. Malaysia provided strong support in international forums, despite previous conflicts with Indonesia, as it sought to repress its own independence movement and leave open the option of incorporating Brunei. The Philippines and Thailand also voted with Indonesia in the UN, with the Philippines also fighting separatists at the time. Singapore was less initially supportive, but later sought to have the situation accepted fait accompli. Portugal, while not providing strong opposition leading up to the invasion, later led international support for self-determination. Resistance shifted to the interior, where Friedland continued to hold territory, known as the Zonas Libertadas. In 1976 administration of these areas was divided into six sectors, each with civilian and military leadership. These sectors covered the traditional regions, Conselhas, of Portuguese rule, and were similarly divided into posts, 
Postos, Sucos, and Aldeas. The Sucos level was removed in 1977. Continuing Indonesian campaigning led to the slow capture of these territories, which this conquest being completed in 1978. In an effort to stamp greater control over its dissident new province, whose seizure was condemned by the United Nations, Indonesia invested considerable sums in Timor's leading to more rapid economic growth which averaged 6% per year over the period 1983 to 1997. Unlike the Portuguese, the Indonesians favored strong, direct rule, which was never accepted by the Timorese people, who were determined to preserve their culture and national identity. By 1976 there were 35,000 Indonesian troops in East Timor. Falintal, the military wing of Fridolin, fought a guerrilla war with marked success in the first few years but weakened considerably thereafter. The cost of the brutal takeover to the East Timorese was huge, it's estimated that at least 100,000 died in the hostilities, and ensuing disease and famine. Other reported death tolls from the 24-year occupation range from 60,000 to 200,000. A detailed statistical report prepared for the Commission for Reception, Truth, and Reconciliation in East Timor cited a lower range of 102,800 conflict-related deaths in the period 1974 to 1999, namely, approximately 18,600 killings and 84,200 excess deaths from hunger and illness. There were also reports of rapes, burning, and sacking of buildings. By February 1976, with troops spreading out from the capital to occupy villages to the east and south, East Timor's Indonesian-appointed deputy governor, Lopez La Cruz, admitted that 60,000 East Timorese had been killed. Troop numbers were increased and draconian controls were imposed on the population, isolating the territory from the outside world. By 1989, Indonesia had things firmly under control and opened East Timor to tourism. Then, on November 12, 1991 Indonesian troops fired on protesters gathered at the Santa Cruz Cemetery in Dili to commemorate the killing of an independence activist. With the event captured on film and aired around the world, the embarrassed Indonesian government admitted to 19 killings, although it's estimated that over 200 died in the massacre. While Indonesia introduced a civilian administration, the military remained in control. Aided by secret police and civilian Timorese militia to crush dissent, reports of arrest, torture, and murder were numerous. Towards independence. Timorese groups fought a campaign of resistance against Indonesian forces for the independence of East Timor, during which many atrocities and human rights violations by the Indonesian army were reported, which Indonesian President Susilo Bambanyudoyono accepted in 2008 that Indonesia had been guilty of. Foreign powers such as the Australian government, concerned to maintain good relations with Indonesia, had been consistently reluctant to assist a push for independence, despite popular sympathy for the East Timorese cause among many in the Australian electorate. However, the departure of President Suharto and a shift in Australian policy by the Howard government in 1998 precipitated a proposal for a referendum on the question of independence. Ongoing lobbying by the Portuguese government also provided impetus. Effects of the Dili Massacre The Dili Massacre on November 12, 1991 was a turning point for sympathy for pro-independence East Timorese. A burgeoning East Timor solidarity movement grew in Portugal, Australia, and the United States. After the massacre, the U.S. Congress voted to cut off funding for IMET training of Indonesian military personnel. However, arms sales continued from the U.S. to the Indonesian National Armed Forces. President Bill Clinton cut off all U.S. military ties with the Indonesian military in 1999. The Australian government promoted a strong connection with the Indonesian military at the time of the massacre, but also cut off ties in 1999. The massacre had a profound effect on public opinion in Portugal, especially after television footage showing East Timorese praying in Portuguese, and independence leader Zanana Gusmao gained widespread respect, being awarded the Portugal's highest honor in 1993, after he had been captured and imprisoned by the Indonesians. Australia's troubled relationship with the Suharto regime was brought into focus by the massacre. In Australia, there was also widespread public outrage, and criticism of Canberra's close relationship with the Suharto regime and recognition of Jakarta's sovereignty over East Timor. This caused the Australian government embarrassment, but Foreign Minister Gareth Evans played down the killings, describing them as an aberration, not an act of state policy. Prime Minister Paul Keatings, 1991-1996, first overseas trip was to Indonesia in April 1992 and sought to improve trade and cultural relations, but repression of the East Timorese continued to mark cooperation between the two nations. 
Gareth Evans and Keatings gave maintenance of close relations with the Indonesian government a high priority, as did the subsequent Prime Minister John Howard and Foreign Minister Alexander Downer during their first term in office, 1996-1998. Australian governments saw good relations and stability in Indonesia, Australia's largest neighbour, as providing an important security buffer to Australia's north. Nevertheless, Australia provided important sanctuary to East Timorese independence advocates like José Ramos Horta, who based himself in Australia during his exile. The fall of President Suharto and the arrival of President B.J. Habibie in 1998 and the rise of Indonesian democracy brought a new prospect for a potential change in the dynamic between the Australian and Indonesian governments. Role of the Catholic Church The Catholic Church in East Timor played an important role in society throughout the Indonesian occupation. While just 20% of East Timorese called themselves Catholics in 1975, the figure surged to reach 95% by the end of the first decade after the invasion. During the occupation, Bishop Carlos Zimenez Bailo became one of the most prominent advocates for human rights in East Timor and many priests and nuns risked their lives in defending citizens from military abuses. Pope John Paul II's 1989 visit to East Timor exposed the occupied territory's situation to world media and provided a catalyst for independence activists to seek global support. Officially neutral, the Vatican wished to retain good relations with Indonesia, the world's largest Muslim nation. Upon his arrival in East Timor, the Pope symbolically kissed a cross then pressed it to the ground, alluding to his usual practice of kissing the ground on arrival in a nation, and yet avoiding overtly suggesting East Timor was a sovereign country. He spoke fervently against abuses in his sermon, whilst avoiding naming the Indonesian authorities as responsible. In 1996, Bishop Carlos Felipe Zimenez Bailo and José Ramos Horta, two leading East Timorese activists for peace and independence, received the Nobel Peace Prize for their work towards a just and peaceful solution to the conflict in East Timor. A number of priests and nuns were murdered in the violence in East Timor that followed the 1999 independence referendum. The newly independent nation declared three days of national mourning upon the death of Pope John Paul II in 2005. International Lobbying Portugal started to apply international pressure, raising the issue with its fellow European Union members as well as in wider forums such as the United Nations Commission on Human Rights and the International Court of Justice. However, other EU countries like the UK had close economic relations with Indonesia, including arms sales, and saw no advantage in forcefully raising the issue. Appeals by those advocating for East Timorese independence were targeted at Western citizens as well as governments, emphasizing the vision of the new state as a liberal democracy. In the mid-1990s, the pro-democracy People's Democratic Party, PRD, in Indonesia called for withdrawal from East Timor. The party's leadership was arrested in July 1996. In July 1997, visiting South African President Nelson Mandela visited Suharto as well as the imprisoned Zanana Gusmao. He urged the freeing of all East Timorese leaders in a note reading, We can never normalize the situation in East Timor unless all political leaders, including Mr. Gusmao, are freed. They are the ones who must bring about a solution. Indonesia's government refused but did announce that it would take three months off Gus Mao's 20 year sentence. In 1998, the Reformasi movement in Indonesia led to the resignation of Suharto and his replacement by President Habibie, which brought political reform towards a more democratic system. In June 1998, facing increasing domestic and international pressure on the issue, Jakarta offered East Timor autonomy within the Indonesian state, although it ruled out independence and stated that Portugal and the UN must recognize Indonesian sovereignty. Referendum for Independence, Violence New Indonesian President B.J. Habibie was prepared to consider a change of status for East Timor. Portugal had started to gain some political allies firstly in the EU, and after that in other places of the world to pressure Indonesia. In late 1998, the Australian Prime Minister John Howard with his Foreign Minister Alexander Downer drafted a letter setting out a major change in Australian policy. The letter supported the idea of autonomy but went much further by suggesting that the East Timors be given a chance to vote on independence within a decade. The letter, which compared East Timor to New Caledonia, upset Habibie, who saw it as implying Indonesia was a colonial power. He decided in response to announce a snap referendum to be conducted within six months. Other reasons for this change of attitude include shifting priorities, greater consideration of international image, and a belief that East Timor would vote for autonomy. In his announcement of the referendum, Habibie cited norms of democracy and justice as a reason to allow for self-determination. News of the proposal provoked a violent reaction in East Timor from pro-Indonesian militia. 
the Indonesian army did not intervene to restore order. At a summit in Bali John Howard told Habibie that a United Nations peacekeeping force should oversee the process. Habibie rejected the proposal, believing it would have insulted the Indonesian military. The United Nations mission in East Timor, Unamet, was created to oversee the referendum in June 1999, six months after Habibie's January announcement. Intimidation from pro-Indonesian militia continued during this period, and the referendum was delayed twice. Eventually, the referendum was held on August 30. It produced a clear majority, 78.5%, in favor of independence, rejecting the alternative offer of being an autonomous province within Indonesia, to be known as the Special Autonomous Region of East Timor, Siret. Before official results were announced, Indonesian military supported East Timorese pro-integration militia and Indonesian soldiers began a campaign of violence and terrorism in retaliation, Operation Clean Sweep. Between 1,500 and 3,000 Timorese were killed, and in addition to internal displacement 300,000 were forcibly pushed into West Timor as refugees. The majority of the country's infrastructure, including homes, irrigation systems, water supply systems and schools and nearly 100% of the country's electrical grid were destroyed. Activists in Portugal, Australia, the United States, and elsewhere pressured their governments to take action. The violence was met with widespread public anger in Australia. The opposition spokesman on foreign affairs, Labour's Laurie Berretton, was vocal in highlighting evidence of the Indonesian military's involvement in pro-integrationist violence and advocated United Nations peacekeeping to support the East Timor's ballot. The Catholic Church in Australia urged the Australian government to send an armed peacekeeping force to East Timor to end the violence. Street protesters harried the Indonesian embassy. John Howard conferred with United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan and lobbied US President Bill Clinton for an Australian-led international peacekeeper force to enter East Timor to end the violence. The United States offered crucial logistical and intelligence resources and an over-horizon deterrent presence. Finally, on September 11th, Bill Clinton announced I have made clear that my willingness to support future economic assistance from the international community will depend upon how Indonesia handles the situation from today. Indonesia, in dire economic straits relented and on September 12, Indonesian President Habibie announced. A couple of minutes ago I called the United Nations Secretary General, Mr. Kofi Annan, to inform about our readiness to accept international peacekeeping forces through the United Nations, from friendly nations, to restore peace and security in East Timor. It was clear that the UN did not have sufficient resources to combat the paramilitary forces directly. Instead, on 15 September the Union authorized the creation of a multinational military force known as Interfe, International Force for East Timor, with Security Council Resolution 1264. Troops were contributed by 17 nations, about 9,900 in total. 4,400 came from Australia, the remainder mostly from Southeast Asia. The force was led by Australian Major General, now General, Peter Cosgrove. On September 20, 1999 Interfei deployed to the country, and Indonesia withdrew both its military and its civilian administration. United Nations Administration On October 15, 1999, the Indonesian People's Consultative Assembly repealed the law annexing East Timor. The administration of East Timor was taken over by the UN through the United Nations Transitional Administration in East Timor, UNTIT established on October 25, and all remaining Indonesian forces left the territory in November. The Interfei deployment ended on February 14, 2000 with the transfer of military command to the UN. The scope of the UNTEAT mission exceeded previous UN peacekeeping efforts. UNTEAT exercised effective sovereignty during this period, and engaged in a state-building process to develop institutions and local capacity, in addition to handling immediate humanitarian and security needs. Tensions existed between the mandate of effective governance, and the mandate to quickly prepare the territory for democratic self-governance. Governance was strongly central east, with less investment in local capacity. A rapid timetable and insufficient engagement with local authorities, including limited cooperation with the National Council of Maburi Resistance, further limited institutional development. Reconstruction efforts included rebuilding the education system. For this textbooks were bought in the new official language, Portuguese, despite many teachers and students being unable to speak it. Elections were held in late 2001 for a constituent assembly to draft a constitution, a task finished in February 2002. East Timor became formally independent on May 20, 2002. 
Zanana Gusmao was sworn in as the country's president. East Timor became a member of the UN on September 27, 2002. The Independent Republic East Timor was occupied by Indonesia for 24 years from 1976 to 1999 in a period many consider to be a genocide. It was estimated by one report that Indonesia was responsible for 180,000 deaths in the 24-year period that it ruled East Timor. The human rights violations of the Indonesian government resulted in a homegrown resistance movement, Fridolin, pushing for independence. The 1991 Dili massacre was a turning point for the independence cause and an East Timor solidarity movement grew in Portugal, the Philippines, Australia, and other Western countries. It was widely reported that between 180 and 200 people had been killed in the massacre. After the widely publicized atrocity, which was recorded on video, U.S. support for Indonesia ended and the U.S. military pulled out of Indonesia. Following civil unrest and protests, Long-time President Suharto fell from power and was replaced by B.J. Habibie. Australian shift in policy and letter from John Howard. Around this time Australian support for Indonesia over East Timor had been changing. Under the past Fraser and Hawke governments, there had been support for Indonesia over its rule of East Timor. Even after the Dili massacre, when the U.S. military pulled out in protest, Paul Keating's government had increased military support, Keating himself was close to Suharto, and had financial dealings with Indonesian business. Three at this time, there was an increase in East Timor itself of more overt feelings towards independence. The Australian government's policy was also shifting, and while in the past it was one of the few countries that recognized Indonesia's control over East Timor, the government's view at this time changed towards the possibility of some sort of autonomy. This shift in policy was initially revealed by journalists, and then formally acknowledged by the Australian Foreign Minister, Alexander Downer, on 12 January 1999. Australian Prime Minister John Howard, proposed by letter to the President of Indonesia that there should be a referendum for the people of East Timor, to do with their autonomy. For while the letter advocated that the referendum take place over the next 10 or 20 years, Indonesian President B.J. Habibie, however, prompted by the letter, decided to have a referendum on independence immediately. Though it was noted there had been a fair amount of diplomacy between the two leaders, who generally had good relations, it was said that Habibie was not happy with the letter, which prompted him to act. Also, from the Indonesian point of view, there was a reluctance to continue to support and invest money into East Timor, for an extended period of time, if in fact Timor would simply leave Indonesia at some point in the future. This was unexpected by the Australian government, who expected the letter to be rejected, and even if it was considered, expected a move to autonomy to be planned and to take place years if not decades in the future. However, the fact that it signalled a change in policy by the Australian government, obviously indicated a change in support for Indonesia over its governance of Timor. Declaration of Referendum On January 27, at the urging of Habibie, the Indonesian cabinet agreed that the issue of East Timor's future should be put to a consultative process in the province. Habibie had gone ahead without the approval of the military, who were largely against the vote. While they didn't stop it, the military frustrated the process, including supporting pro-integration militia. They also delayed acceptance of peacekeepers. Vote. Widespread slayings by the Indonesian military and associated militias followed the vote's announcement. It was estimated that around 1,500 East Timorese were killed and more than 250,000 forcibly displaced into Indonesian territory. A huge amount of infrastructure was destroyed, estimated to be around 80%. Those that survived struggled to feed and look after themselves and their families. The United Nations organized a mission to conduct the vote. This body, UNAMET, was unarmed, and was specifically designed to set up voting centers and register voters. However, there was wide-ranging violence designed to impair the vote. Despite this, UNAMET managed to register 451,792 voters out of a population of around 800,000 in East Timor and abroad. When the 1999 East Timorese independence referendum was held on August 30, 1999, some 98% of registered voters went to the polls. The result was markedly for a break with Indonesia, 78.5% of East Timorese chose independence from Indonesia. Immediately following this, the Indonesian military being resistant to the deployment of peacekeepers, some politicians involved on both sides, including Downer and Habibie, expected that there could have been a war between Indonesia and those countries supplying the peacekeeping forces. Following the vote, there was a period where the Indonesian military resisted peacekeepers. However, 
continued diplomatic requests by John Howard, as well as covert U.S. pressure on the Indonesian military, saw Indonesia back down. On September 12, Habibie said that Indonesia would accept peacekeepers. East Timor devolved into violence following the September 4, 1999 ballot result, with the people overwhelmingly voting for independence. The Indonesian army declared martial law on September 6, but also aided the militias who were causing the violence and destruction. Peacekeeping Force Australian government representatives, in particular the Prime Minister and John Howard, used diplomacy to get support for peacekeepers and the peaceful governance of East Timor while it transitioned. The US military also made overtures to the Indonesian military that they needed to accept peacekeepers, and that the violence was unacceptable. In particular, pro-Indonesia militia caused destruction, and much infrastructure, including school and university buildings, were destroyed. This took place during the APEC summit held in Auckland, where a lot of diplomatic action amongst the attendees saw more support for protecting the East Timorese from violence. The Australian-led peacekeeping force, Interfei arrived on September 20, 1999, though many people had been killed and much destruction had been done. The lead-up to the operation remained politically and militarily tense. The Royal Australian Air Force, RAF, redeployed frontline combat aircraft F-18S and F-111S northward to Tyndall in the Northern Territory to act as a deterrent against escalation of the conflict by the Indonesian military on at least one occasion Australian P-3C aircraft were intercepted by Indonesian aircraft, while an Indonesian submarine was also detected by coalition surveillance within the vicinity of Dili Harbour as Interfei forces approached. Ultimately no serious incidents occurred and the intervention was successful, however, Australia, Indonesia relations would take several years to recover. Of the 22 nations involved in Interfei, 10 provided naval vessels. Australia provided 14 ships with Interfei between September 19, 1999 and February 23, 2000, the frigates Adelaide, Anzac, Darwin, Sydney, Newcastle, and Melbourne, the landing ship Tobruk, the landing craft Bailey Papan, Brunei, Labuan, Tarakan, and Batano, the fast transport Jervis Bay, and the replenishment vessel Success. The United States contributed seven ships, the cruiser Mobile Bay, the amphibious assault ships Bellow Wood, Paliliu, and Juno, and the replenishment ships Kilauea, San Jose, and Tipicanoo. France supplied four vessels, the frigates Vendemier and Prairial plus the landing ships Sirocco and Jacques Cartier. Singapore contributed the amphibious landing ships Excellence, Intrepid, and Perseverance. New Zealand deployed the frigates T.E. Kaha and Canterbury and the replenishment ship Endeavour. Other naval vessels deployed during the operation included the Canadian replenishment ship Protector, the Italian amphibious assault ship San Justo, the Portuguese frigate Vasco da Gama, the Thai landing ship Surin, and the British destroyer Glasgow. The International Forces East Timor, Interfei, coalition began deploying to East Timor on September 20, 1999, as a non-un force operating in accordance with UN resolutions. Australia led the operation and contributed 5,500 personnel and the force commander, Major General Peter Cosgrove. It was tasked with restoring peace and security, protecting and supporting UNAMET, and facilitating humanitarian assistance. The Australian Deployable Joint Force Headquarters provided overall command and control. The main Australian combat element included infantry and cavalry provided by the 3rd Brigade. Due to the nature of the operation the force deployed without its artillery and other heavy weapons and equipment, however, 105mm and 155mm guns and Leopard tanks were available and on standby in Darwin for rapid deployment if required. It was supported by the 3rd Combat Engineer Regiment, 103rd Signal Squadron, 110th Signal Squadron, and elements of the 3rd Brigade Administrative Support Battalion. Twelve Black Hawk helicopters from the 5th Aviation Regiment were also deployed. Other force-level troops included military police, an intelligence company, an electronic warfare squadron, elements of an artillery locating battery, and topographic survey personnel. Special forces played a key role, with an Australian squadron from the Special Air Service Regiment, SASR, a troop from the New Zealand Special Air Service, ENGES, and a troop from the British Special Boat Service, SBS, forming response force, RESP-4. An advance party of Gurkhas from the 2nd Battalion, the Royal Gurkha Rifles, 2RGR, and British Royal Marines Commandos from the Fleet Standby Rifle Troop, FSRT, secured the foothills and areas to the south of the city. 3rd Battalion, Royal Australian Regiment, 3RAR, began landing the next day at the port, 
along with the 2nd Cavalry Regiment equipped with the Slav Light Armored Vehicles and the remainder of the company group from 2 RGR arrived. No. 2 Airfield Defense Squadron, 2 AFDS, arrived the following day to permanently secure Komora Airport replacing 2 RAR. Additional Australian forces and support personnel arrived in the days that followed as Interfay continued to grow, as did forces from a number of other countries, in particular from New Zealand. Most United Nations mission in East Timor, Unamet, personnel had already been evacuated from the region in the preceding months by the Royal Australian Air Force, although a small number had remained behind. With the withdrawal of the Indonesian forces and officials, Unamet re-established its headquarters in Dili on September 28 and on October 19, 1999, Indonesia formally recognized the result of the independence referendum. Soon after, the United Nations Transitional Administration in East Timor, UNTEAT, was established as a peacekeeping operation which was also fully responsible for the administration of East Timor to oversee its transition to independence. With only limited forces available, Cosgrove adopted the oil spot concept of dominating key areas from which the surrounding areas could be influenced and then secured, moving quickly by helicopter to keep the militia off balance. The large airfield at Baco was secured by two platoons from 2 RAR on September 22, who were relieved by the Philippine Army non-combat contingent known as the Philippine Humanitarian Support Mission to East Timor, PhilHSMET, three days later. Interface saw a number of engagement with militia, in which there were casualties on both sides. On February 28, 2000, Interfay handed over command of military operations to United Nations Transitional Administration in East Timor, UNTEED. The force suffered one battle death, a New Zealand private shot dead in an engagement with Indonesian forces slash militia. UNTEED. United Nations administered East Timor. On October 19, 1999, the Indonesian government, on October 19, 1991, formally recognized the result of the vote. On October 25, the United Nations Security Council, created UNTEAT, the United Nations Transitional Administration in East Timor. This was an armed peacekeeping operation that would be responsible for the administration of East Timor during its transition to an independent state. It would provide law, order, and public administration during this period. Various countries supplied personnel for UNTEAT. Australia led the forces, and provided the largest contingent as well as providing the out-of-theater base for operations. Portugal sent the second largest contingent securing the key central areas of the country, followed by New Zealand, who took responsibility for the southern west sector with supporting troops from Ireland, Fiji, Nepal, and Singapore. France also sent special forces who joined the ANZACs on the first day, as well as contingents from Philippines, Sweden, Brazil, Kenya, Japan, Malaysia, Singapore, South Korea, Thailand, Canada, Denmark, Italy, the and the United Kingdom. The United States supported the transition authority, however didn't supply personnel, their main involvement being to underwrite contracts for replacing infrastructure that had been destroyed by the militias and Indonesian military. The United States supplied police officers to serve with the international police. A national consultative council was established in December 1999 by UNTEAT Reg 1999-2, and served as a forum for East Timorese political and community leaders to advise the transitional administrator and discuss policy issues. The council had 11 Timorese members and four international members. A transitional judicial service commission was also established to ensure representation of East Timorese leaders in decisions affecting the judiciary in East Timor. The commission was made up of three Timorese representatives and two international experts. Security was initially provided by the International Force for East Timor, Interfay, but was assumed by UNTEED Peacekeeping Force, PKF, in February 2000. Law and order was maintained by a United Nations civilian police force, CIPOL, until an East Timorese police service was established in April 2000. In July 2000, the membership of the National Consultative Council was expanded to 36 members, including one representative from each of the 13 districts of East Timor. The body was renamed the National Council. All the members were now Timorese and represented the main political parties and religious communities of East Timor. The National Council became a legislature-style body and had the right to debate any future regulations issued by UNTEED. This was followed by the establishment of an executive body, the Transitional Cabinet of East Timor, was formed comprising four international members. Four Timorese members, following this, a judicial system was established with a Prosecutor General's Office and a Defender Service established. District Courts and Court of Appeal were also established. 
In September 2000, the Transitional Cabinet approves the establishment of an East Timor Defense Force. The force was formally established in February 2001 and the guerrilla movement Falintal was officially disbanded with many of its members joining the new force. A voter registration process was completed during this period and preparations were made for elections to a constituent assembly that would prepare East Timor for independence expected in 2002. Independence In the lead-up to the date for independence, there were ongoing diplomatic spats. Six naval vessels appeared in East Timorese territorial waters on Friday, May 17. The official reason give for this was to protect President Megawati Sakarno Putri who was attending the ceremony, even thousands of UN soldiers in East Timor had guaranteed her security. The East Timorese interim government conditionally granted permission for the Indonesian landing ship Teluk Sampit to enter the port of Dili, however, it had 120 armed soldiers on board instead of the previously nominated 15. Because of this, the ship therefore left the harbour again to anchored a few hundred metres off the coast. Dili's bishop, Nobel Peace Prize laureate Carlos Felipe Zimenez Belo on Sunday May 15 celebrated a mass at his residence at 7 a.m. All members of the future government and the national parliament were invited to the service. The flag of East Timor was blessed, and raised at midnight. Delegations representing countries from all over the world arrived during the day, including President Bill Clinton the United States with former, Angola's Foreign Minister Joao Bernardo de Miranda, Australian Prime Minister John Howard, Brazilian Foreign Minister Celso Leiferer, Portuguese Prime Minister José Manuel Barroso and President Jorge Sampaio and New Zealand's Prime Minister Helen Clark. UN Secretary General Kofi Annan landed in the capital Dili in the afternoon. All up, 300 guests of honor from 90 different countries attended the independence ceremony. At 1 p.m. East Timorese protested over the dispute over the demarcation line against Australia in front of the Old Town Market. Following that, the opening of the Expo Esperanca, Exhibition of Hope, took place there, with Prime Minister John Howard and East Timorese Chief Minister and Prime Minister-designate Mari Binamud al -Kateri. At 5.45 p.m. Kofi Annan opened the Parque de Paz, Peace Park, in Lesadir. In the three weeks leading up to Independence Day, a statue of Mary, brought from Fatima in Italy by Bishop Bailo, traveled around the country. East Timor, being largely a Catholic state, was dedicated to the Our Lady of Fatima on Independence Day. The statue is now in Dili Cathedral. East Timor officially regained independence on May 20, 2002 after three years under the United Nations Interim Administration for East Timor, UNTED. From East Timor's perspective, this was the re-establishment of national independence, following the proclamation of independence from Portugal on November 28, 1975, and the Indonesian occupation nine days later. May 20 is a national holiday in East Timor as Independence Day or Day of Restoration of Independence. The Ceremony At 6 p.m., a mass was held on the grounds of the celebrations in Tisitalu. At 9.30 p.m. the official ceremony for the start of independence began. Many East Timorese people in traditional costume with headdresses, swords, surik, and colorful ties fabrics attended, and as part of the ceremony, there were folklore performances and traditional ceremonies. The 13 districts and the island of Atoro were also presented, as was the creation legend of the Good Crocodile, from which the island of Timor is said to have emerged. The commemoration of the Fridolin martyrs of the war against the Indonesian occupation was introduced with the poem Um Matuto do Silencio by the national poet Francisco Borja da Costa. Hundreds of candles were carried onto the fairground and a traditional funeral song was sung. The images shown in the television broadcast included photos of well-known fallen Timorese fighters, photos of the Australian Balibo 5 and the memorial site for the massacre in Aleu in 1942. The former Falintal fighters then moved in. At around 11.20 p.m., the East Timorese Nobel Peace Prize winner Jose Ramos Horta welcomed those present and the future president of East Timor Zanana Gusmao and Megawati, who were demonstratively arriving together. Other folkloric performances followed. The formal ceremony of the transfer of power from the United Nations to the new East Timorese government began with a speech by Hans Jung Su, President of the United Nations General Assembly. This was followed by the speech by UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, which he said Parabens, Boasort, E Obrigado Barak. Viva Timor Leste. All the best, good luck and thank you. Long live East Timor, ended exactly at midnight. Gus Mao joined Annan at the lectern and Annan explained as Secretary General of the United Nations, I am honored to transfer executive authority of the United Nations Interim Administration, UNTED, to the institutions of the Democratic Republic of Timor-Leste. 
2006 crisis. Unrest started in the country in April 2006 following riots in Delhi. A rally in support of 600 East Timorese soldiers, who were dismissed for deserting their barracks, turned into rioting where five people were killed and over 20,000 fled their homes. Fierce fighting between pro-government troops and disaffected philintel troops broke out in May 2006. 49 While unclear, the motives behind the fighting appeared to be the distribution of oil funds and the poor organization of the Timorese army and police, which included former Indonesian-trained police and former Timorese rebels. Prime Minister Mari al Qadari called the violence a coup and welcomed offers of foreign military assistance from several nations. As of May 25, 2006, Australia, Portugal, New Zealand, and Malaysia sent troops to Timor, attempting to quell the violence. At least 23 deaths occurred as a result of the violence. On June 21, 2006, President Zanin Agusmao formally requested Prime Minister Mari al Qadari step down. A majority of Fridolin Party members demanded the Prime Minister's resignation, accusing him of lying about distributing weapons to civilians. On June 26, 2006 Prime Minister Mari al Qadari resigned stating, I declare I am ready to resign my position as Prime Minister of the government, so as to avoid the resignation of His Excellency the President of the Republic. In August, rebel leader Alfredo Rionato escaped from Becara prison, in Dili. Tensions were later raised after armed clashes between youth gangs forced the closure of Presidente Nicolau Lobato International Airport in late October. In April 2007, Gus Mao declined another presidential term. In the build-up to the April 2007 presidential elections there were renewed outbreaks of violence in February and March 2007. Jose Ramos Horta was inaugurated as president on May 20, 2007, following his election win in the second round. 55 Gus Mao was sworn in as Prime Minister on August 8, 2007. President Ramos Horta was critically injured in an assassination attempt on February 11, 2008, in a failed coup apparently perpetrated by Alfredo Rionato, a renegade soldier who died in the attack. Prime Minister Gus Mao also faced gunfire separately but escaped unharmed. The Australian government immediately sent reinforcements to East Timor to keep order. From 2010s. New Zealand announced in early November 2012, it would be pulling its troops out of the country, saying the country was now stable and calm. Five New Zealand troops were killed in the 13 years the country had a military presence in East Timor. Francisco Guterres of centre-left Fridolin Party was the president of East Timor since May 2017 until May 19, 2022. The main party of AMP Coalition, National Congress for Timorese Reconstruction, led by independence hero Zanin Agusmao, was in power from 2007 to 2017, but leader of Fridolin Mari al Qadari formed a coalition government after July 2017 parliamentary election. However, the new minority government soon fell, meaning second general election in May 2018. In June 2018, former president and independence fighter Jose Maria de Vasconcelos known as Tor Matanruek of three-party coalition, Alliance of Change for Progress, AMP, became the new prime minister. The Nobel Prize winner, former President Jose Ramos Horta won the April 2022 presidential election runoff against the incumbent president, Francisco Guterres. In May 2022, Ramos Horta was sworn in as East Timor president. The End